it's really kind of exciting to be here <laughs> virtually. Um, I was really looking forward to coming to Brizzy, but you know, the world happened. So here we are. Uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of me, I've got a whole variety of contacts. So I'm on Twitter. Uh, technically, I'm on Instagram. I don't really understand Instagram, I have to admit, but I'm there if um, you want to contact us. And also, we've got a Facebook page, and then there's good old email. So as Toby said, we're the Insect Behavior and Ecology Lab. We actually recently had a name change to the Invertebrate Behavior and Ecology Lab just to make it more vague because we started working on things that are not technically insects. Uh, in terms of the things the lab covers, just generally, um, most of what we, we do probably falls in the decision making and problem solving space. So trying to understand how organisms make decisions. Um, we also look at urban insect ecology and conservation. So increasingly, we're trying to understand how to make our cities um, better places for invertebrate biodiversity, uh, in particular native bees and sustainable pollination systems. So um, as Toby was saying, working in agricultural systems, um, both urban, peri-urban and, and rural systems to try to figure out how we can make our systems more sustainable. Uh, and there's a little bit of pest management that's increasingly coming into that as well. Uh, and social insects is complex systems. So trying to understand how organisms coordinate together to solve problems that maybe individually they wouldn't be able to. Uh, in terms of the study systems we work with, I have never met an invertebrate I didn't love. So as a consequence, we start end up working on quite a variety of things. Our bread and butter is really bees, well, our bees, slime molds, and ants. Um, but we also have started working a little bit with hoverflies, soldier flies, uh, and even that cute little velvet worm in, in the bottom that you can see. Uh, so if you want to uh, ask any questions about any of those systems, I'm happy to talk about them. Today, I'm going to focus on ants and slime molds. So when we think of you know, behavior or decision making or problem solving, I think what usually comes to mind are organisms like these, you know, vertebrates, furry things, uh, organisms with big, relatively large brains doing you know, fairly complicated things. Uh, increasingly, we're starting to see more study systems, and there's some great work here at, you know, at UQ on you know, honeybee cognition in particular. Uh, we're also seeing stuff on fruit flies and a few other invertebrate organisms. So we're starting to broaden, I think, our focus away from just those classic um, vertebrate taxa. But, you know, and I feel like Captain Obvious saying this, one of the things all of those systems have in common is the fact that they all have brains. So they're all organisms that have this amazing centralized information processing organ um, that they use to be able to make decisions. And I bring this up because you know, really the vast majority of organisms on planet Earth are brainless. You know, there's this huge brainless majority. And it's always super tempting to throw in a politician joke here. <laughs> I'm not going to, but... Um, you know, we're, we're missing so like 97% of life on the planet has no brain. Uh, and these organisms are ecologically, medically, economically important. They include things like the fungus, the fungi, um, protozoans, um, you know, plants, bacteria, all of these different organisms. Uh, and like their brained counterparts, these organisms also have to be able to make decisions. They have to live in a world that's complex. They have to often find resources in order to survive. In some cases, they need to find mates, yet they have to do all of that kind of decision making in the absence of a brain. And so I think it's an interesting question to ask how, how do they do that? How do they manage? And so you can almost think of life as this continuum between you know, so the brained organisms, the things that have a single brain that handles all of their information processing um, work, or at least most of it. And then on the other hand, you have these unbraid, these brainless organisms, which are organisms that don't have, that can't benefit from that centralized type of processing and have to figure things out a different way. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you can think about things with lots of brains. So systems where a large proportion of the decision making doesn't happen on the individual level, it happens on the group level. And so the challenge for those systems is how to coordinate a whole bunch of individual brains towards solving particular problems. And we know that many of the most successful organisms on the planet, at least in terms of biomass, are, are collectives. They're organisms like ants and termites and, and some types of bees, which form colonies and behave together uh, cooperatively. So all of these different decision processing systems, although they're, very, they're extremely different in terms of the mechanisms they use, 
they all face common challenges. There's certain things they all have to do. And so one of the questions that fascinates me is, is trying to figure out how all of these very different types of decision systems solve these common core challenges. And so today I'm going to talk about two challenges in particular, uh, transportation network problems uh, and multi-attribute foraging problems. And, and the goal is to try to see if we start to see any, you know, are there any commonalities in the way systems deal with these problems or, you know, are they just totally different from one another? So we'll start with transportation problems. Uh, I find transportation systems just fascinating. I think, you know, any civilization on earth that we look at, they, their success often rests on the efficiency of their transportation systems. And it's been like that from, you know, pretty much day dot. Transportation systems allow societies to move resources, um, information, individuals from place to place. And having an efficient transportation system, you know, is, is really important for, say, acquiring and distributing resources. Transportation systems are also fundamental to most biological systems. And so you can think of things like the trail networks of ants, which are, I think, one of the more, more obvious versions. But you can also think of the mycelial networks of fungi, where the organism is the transportation network. They're essentially the same. You can think of the root network of plants or tunnel networks, burrows. Um, sometimes these are created by one species, but you can also see things like multi-species game trails where lots of individual species or lots of individuals um, from different species um, just sort of incidentally, because of the way they move to the environment, form these trails. Um, and, and trail construction can be is often self-organized. So, for example, you often if you're walking around outside, you may see these kind of, they're called desire trails. And what happens here is somebody, the trail builder, decided to make that sort of loopy um, trail. And people have just decided that they don't want to walk that way because humans typically put a big premium on being able to go to, from point A to point B directly. And we also like to walk on a smoother surface. And so how these form is that the first person kind of reaches that point and goes, I don't really want to walk on that, that path. It's out of my way. And they kind of take a shortcut. And they pay that cost for kind of walking through slightly more uneven, uncomfortable grass, but they're happy to do it. But just the action of them walking stamps down that grass a little bit so that the next person comes there, takes a look and says, oh, well, that one's already a little bit cleared. So they're more likely to start taking that side path. And, and over time, that kind of forms a positive feedback loop that means you end up with these desire paths that go the way that um, people collectively would like to go. So it's a self-organized sort of trail. Um, and, as, and because it's self-organized, it's interesting because it sort of solves problems even though every individual, they're not explicitly cooperating. And you can see things like this where it's, it's almost like the trail network is avoiding danger uh, because people have just decided that trail is ridiculous and gone around it. So trails networks are interesting, I think, uh, examples of self-organized problem solving where you have um, collectives of organisms creating these trail systems that need to meet certain objectives. Uh, but they're also interesting from an ecological perspective because the transportation systems drive uh, resource exploitation and exploration. So again, if you think about ant colonies, how their trail networks are distributed on the landscape has a huge impact on which food resources they're able to obtain and, and uh, protect, and also which other individuals or which other species they may run into. So trails can also mediate into ecological interactions. And again, you can think of uh, predators using game trails to find their prey or prey having to make decisions about whether to use that nice easy trail uh, and take the risk of running into a predator versus kind of going off into the bush. So trail systems are fascinating in the sense that they can, they're, they're interesting on a whole bunch of different levels. So I'm going to focus on the trail networks of ants because I said ants are um, really some of the bread and butter organisms that we work on. They're also just kind of obvious uh, places to start because their trails are so conspicuous. Like I've never met a person who hasn't seen an ant trail at least once. They're everywhere. Um, and they can vary quite a lot from these really uh, constructed trail systems that are more like tunnels to more ephemeral trail systems like the ones we typically see attacking our picnics, for example. Uh, and trail formation happens in ants. It's, it's not, uh, for trailing ants, trail formation isn't really a passive process. It's not the, the same as when humans accidentally kind of make these desire paths. Instead, uh, and I should say this is, an, this is something of a generalization over simplification, that the details of the process vary from species to species, but in general, trailing ants work such that one ant will walk through the environment, 
um, laying little droplets of this attractive pheromone as she walks. Uh, other ants are more attracted to higher concentrations of pheromone um, than they are to areas that have lower or no pheromone. And so if an ant walks in one direction, the next ant that comes by is more likely to follow her trail. She also lays pheromone, which makes that trail even stronger. And as a consequence, <clears throat> excuse me, you get this positive feedback loop where trails start to get reinforced more and more. Uh, and so they start to converge into a trail system. So the ants that I work with are polydomus. Uh, polydomus means that they have multiple nests. So you can have one colony, one colony unit, but that colony divides itself into several spatially disparate nests. Uh, and then the ants will connect up those nests to one another using trails, and they'll also connect the nests to stable food resources. Usually this involves colonies of things like aphids or lerps, which are, are sap secreting insects that the, ins the ants um, use as a major food source. So when we think of this question, one of the simplest things is to ask, okay, so if you're an ant colony and you have all of these nests located in different places, what is the best way to connect up those points? And, you know, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that best um, just depends on which criteria you want to optimize. There are lots of different things you could possibly optimize. Uh, one of them might be cost. So it's reasonable to say that if it costs energy to build a trail network, one of the objectives might be to reduce cost. If we do that, there are particular ways to connect up points that can minimize cost. One of these is called a minimum spanning tree. Uh, it's very low cost, so you can see it doesn't take a lot of trails. You're not investing heaps in trail construction. But it has this real problem that it's got basically zero robustness. So any kind of damage to that trail anywhere on any of the trails will lead to at least one point being disconnected from the network. Uh, and depending on the ecology of the species, that may or may not be a big problem. So you can see again, any kind of damage will cause um, disruption to the trail network. So minimum spanning trees are low cost, but they're also low robustness. So we could say the opposite and say, oh, okay, I really want a really robust network. Um, I don't want to risk any kind of disconnection. And you could build a robust network. And one of the ways of doing this is called a Delaunay triangulation. Uh, it has the feature of high robustness, so you can see pretty clearly that, you know, you can do a lot of damage to a lot of trails, and there's often an alternate way to get to where you want to. So it takes quite a bit of damage before you actually have a disconnection. So it's a high robustness uh, trail way to connect up points. Unfortunately, because you have to make so many trails, it's also very expensive. And again, that assumes that trail, um, the cost of trail construction um, relates to how long the trails are. So if that's the case, then Delaunay triangulations are expensive. So you get this really interesting trade-off that has actually been known about since the 1700s. Uh, it's called the transportation problem. And what it says is that you can build a robust network by you know, really connecting things up. You could build a cheap network, but you can't do both at the same time. So in practice for human systems, often we're aiming for sort of that balance point in between where we get some robustness and some uh, cheapness uh, rather than either of the extremes. Uh, so it's interesting to ask, okay, that, that problem would be universal to networks. So, you know, what do natural systems do when they're faced with this trade-off between robustness and cost? So the first species um, I'm going to talk about today are the Argentine ants. Uh, Argentine ants are an invasive species in Australia. They form really, really massive super colonies. Uh, in that picture, the Argentine ants are not that big ant getting beat up. They're the little tiny ants doing the beating up. They're very, very aggressive insects, uh, at least in terms of other species. And when they move into an area, they tend to kick out um, or outcompete many of the native species. So ecologically not a great species. Uh, but because they form these multi-nest networks, they're a really good species to be able to work with in the lab to start to look at how um, systems solve transportation problems. So the way we did this was to set up situations where the ants had to connect up nests. So we can take nests and put them into arenas and we can arrange those nests wherever we want uh, and then ask the ants to connect them. Since this was the very first experiment we did on transportation networks, we tried to keep it really simple uh, and used either a triangle where the nests are at the vertices of the triangle or a square where again, the nests are at the corner of a square. Because they're simple shapes, we can kind of think through all the um, all the sensible ways one could connect those up. So as I said before, the shortest way of connecting up, uh, in this case is something called a Steiner tree. 
it's a little different from the minimal spanning tree I talked about before in that it's got those extra nodes, those intermediate points, and those serve to kind of reduce the overall trail um, length. The next shortest network would be a minimal spanning tree. And then you can think of a cycle where you connect up all, um, each nest is connected to the nests around it. And then, you know, a complete graph where every point is connected to every other point. And these range from sort of robust on, oh, sorry, robust on one side uh, and cost effective or cheap on the other side. And so essentially what we do is we see where the ants fall. I should mention that these are the sensible ways to connect up uh, points. Of course, it's possible that ants could just have sort of a random mishmash uh, of trails, like a spider web of trails between points uh, or trails going nowhere. Um, all of those are possible. Um, so I'll just to quickly show you some of the results then. Uh, this is a trail network from Argentine ants. It's an overlay, so we've taken a whole bunch of photographs and stacked them on top of each other just to make the trail a little bit more clear. Uh, the red dots show you the locations of the nests. The nests are actually under the arena. The ants are climbing up those sticks into the arena and then they're wandering around and connecting them however they want. And what they've done in this case is a Steiner-like tree. Um, just in case there's any mathematicians in the audience, I'm gonna say Steiner-like. Um, technically, I've been told that to be a Steiner tree, the, the, a true Steiner tree, each trail has to be perfectly straight and they need to connect at exactly the right angle and, you know, they're ants, <laughs> you know, they don't really always walk in a straight line. So technically speaking, this is a Steiner-like tree and not exactly a Steiner tree, but they're ants. And I think it's incredible that they, you know, are able to do anything remotely like this. And just lest you think I'm only showing you like the one time it happened, the majority of uh, triangle configurations were things that were either minimal spanning trees or Steiner trees. Um, and, you know, occasionally we would get trail networks where there'd be one odd uh, trail or one trail going kind of in a weird direction, but by and large they looked more or less like this. Uh, in the four nest situation, we got more minimal spanning trees than Steiner trees. Um, and again, there's little things that are a bit strange, like the one in the left-hand corner there that the um, the lines don't add, don't um, intersect at a perfect angle. But you know, they're ants. Pretty cool that they can do this anyway. So that experiment showed us that Argentine ants at least seem to be building these very minimal topologies and they seem to do it quite consistently. Um, within 24 hours, you get these minimal topologies most of the time. Uh, what's nice is that we have a pretty good idea of how the insects are doing this because Argentine ants, I mean, even among ants, they're really not clever individually. Um, it's not like individual ants are thinking, okay, what's the shortest way for me to connect up these points? We know that this is a collective process. So um, the overall pattern we're seeing is the combination of all these relatively simple behaviors. In the case of the ants, those simple behaviors go like this. If you're an ant and you're walking around, you lay pheromone all the time. So you're walking around leaving this like trail of breadcrumbs almost like a pheromone trail behind you. Um, that trail has a half-life of about 20 minutes. So it, it evaporates over time and gets weaker and weaker. Uh, and if you're an ant, you're more likely to travel to follow um, a more concentrated trail to a less concentrated trail. So you can imagine that if you have a meandering sort of loopy trail between points, uh, there's just gonna be fewer, there's lower ant density on that trail just because it's long and meandering, which means you get less concentration of pheromone, which means that trail is less attractive than a short direct trail, which is getting more, um, more, more density of ants and more concentrated pheromone. And because it's more concentrated than that more meandering trail, more ants will go to that shorter trail, which will make it stronger, which again sets off this uh, positive feedback process. And you can see that a little bit here. This is a, a time lapse, time lapse shots again, overlays of um, one network forming. And you can see that early on, I, there's not a whole lot going on. The trails, there's a lot of loops. So those are kind of redundancies. There's trails going off into the corner for some reason. There's nothing in that corner that they should be going to. Uh, a little bit later, you can see already that the backbone of trail, there's clearly a stronger link in the direct connections, but there's still a few loops. But over time, those redundancies and those extra bits start to evaporate uh, until about the six hour mark, you really just have the direct connections between nests. So this process, and, and we can model this pretty well, um, those very basic rules allow Argentine ants to create these really um, minimal networks, even though individual ants probably are, don't have any idea what they're actually doing. So that's neat, but of course, if you think back to what I had said earlier, 
Uh, these kinds of configurations are cheap, but they're totally not robust. So any damage to any of those trails and a nest is going to be disconnected. And that to me felt like an odd, uh, an odd solution for the ants to get. But when you think about it, trailing ants like Argentine ants, um, their networks are essentially self-healing. So if you're ever bored and you're outside and you try to you know, put your hand over an ant trail, I mean, the ants will just flow around obstructions like, like water. Um, they're not really that constrained by physical obstructions. And so it kind of makes sense that given that these networks are very dynamic and we know from other experiments that, you know, if you put new food sources down or you move food around, um, the network just kind of morphs into whatever shape it needs to be very quickly. So having that kind of dynamic, almost self-healing network, maybe that removes the, the, the uh, usefulness of having topological robustness. You don't need it because your network um, heals very quickly anyway. So that kind of got us thinking that, okay, so a lot of ants form trail networks, these ephemeral trail networks that can kind of heal themselves, but there are other species of ants that invest a lot more in the construction of their trail systems. Uh, and these can be things like tunnels or the, the guarded arcades uh, or, or the Australian meat ant, which is the picture uh, on the side that looks a bit like a star. And what's happened here is that meat ants will physically clear every little bit of vegetation from their trail network. Like they, they actually sit there with their jaws clipping bits of grass and throwing it to the side to make these cleared runways. It appears to be a pretty big investment of energy and time. And so we reasoned that in that case, maybe we would see more topological robustness um, in this kind of a system. Because you can imagine that if a tree falls across that trail, um, even if the ants can kind of walk, make their way around, they're not able to rebuild that network nearly as fast as the Argentine ants. It's going to take time, and in that time, uh, there's going to be disruption to the normal flow of activity through the colony. So maybe in that case, it makes more sense to have some robustness and backup ways of getting around. So the idea that we had then was to go out and map as many meat ant networks as we could to try to get a sense of the shape of those networks. And, you know, as you do, you sit down before you're planning this big field season uh, and start going through preliminary uh, or doing a literature search. And in the process of that literature search, I realized that somebody had already done that. So um, Ellen Van Wilkenberg and her uh, then supervisor, Mark Elgar in Melbourne had gone out years before and mapped hundreds of meat ant networks, 110 meat ant networks on a, a station in Victoria. Um, luckily, they were looking at a very different question, uh, and when I got in touch with Ellen, she was happy to share those, those maps, and so we were able to kind of skip the field step and just get uh, 110 map networks handed to us, which was amazing. Uh, to analyze these networks, though, was a bit more complicated because unlike the Argentine ant situation where we purposely could uh, configure the, the nest in a way that was easy to analyze, um, the meat ants could have built their nests wherever they wanted. We're, we're mapping existing networks rather than forcing them to make their own. Um, and so I, I got some help from a colleague, Ganel Cabanas, who's a mathematician at the University of Paris. Uh, and together we were able to figure out ways to kind of get a sense of the topology of these networks. And so there's, there's three things we looked at. Uh, robustness, which again is the proportion of trails that you can remove from a network without isolating one or more nests. Uh, efficiency, which is the mean shortest distance between two nodes. So it's a way of measuring how easy it is for me as an individual to get where I want to go without having to go through intermediate nodes. Uh, and then cost, which is just the sum of the length of all trails in the network. So how much does it cost to build the network, assuming that there's a strong relationship between cost and sort of network length. When we do this, I think the easiest way to visualize the results is kind of using this, this, uh, this type of a graph. And, it's got robustness on one corner, cheapness on the other, and efficiency on the third corner. And what we did is we looked at the nodes in our existing meat ant networks, and then we would simulate a Delaunay triangulation, for example, which is a model network that is sort of the most robust way to connect up those points. We can take those same nodes and look at what, it would, what metrics we would get uh, if we used a minimal spanning tree to connect those up. And then we can compare all of those to the meat ant networks to see how meat ants compare to those. And of course we can compare them to random as well, although I won't show that here. So if you do that to refresh your memory, uh, a Delaunay triangulation would come out roughly here. So um, it's very robust, but it's got kind of moderate efficiency and it's not very cheap. So it, it sort of falls here. A minimal spanning tree, which is that shortest pathway would be very, very cheap. So it falls in that space, but has basically no robustness and sort of similar efficiency to 
um, similar but not exactly the same efficiency to the Delaunay triangulation. And then on average, the MEDA networks kind of fell out here. So this is really interesting because they're not as robust as the Delaunay triangulation, which kind of makes sense because that's really expensive. Um, and they're not as cheap as the minimal spanning tree, but they kind of fall in this sweet, this sweet spot in between. So they're, they're cheaper than you would expect by chance. Um, they're slightly less robust than you would expect if they were randomly connected, but again, that makes sense given that there's a cost associated with it. And so uh, interestingly, it looks like the Medans are kind of doing what we would expect them to do. They're building a trail network that's intermediate between being really connected and being a minimal spanning solution. And you can see that this is just an example network here where this is the Delaunay triangulation, the, the spanning tree, and then the, what the Medans actually connected it up like on the right. So Medans are kind of doing a more balanced situation. Um, now, ideally, we'd like to understand how these networks form. Um, and over the years, I've had lots of hypotheses about how this might work, uh, including that they might be using the same kind of pruning process we see in Argentine ants. There's no evidence for that. I think we can say pretty confidently now that they're not using a pruning process. Um, so it's a bit of a mystery how the ants collectively are building these networks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, unfortunately, meat ant networks are very long lived, so a meat ant colony can live up to a century. Uh, and so it's really difficult to watch this forming in real time. We, we are mapping and sort of checking networks twice a year now for the foreseeable future to hopefully get that data set, but given how long they live, it could be decades before we have a reasonable sample size. So that's, that remains a bit of a mystery. So what we've been doing instead is, is to try to focus in and ask more targeted questions about how the colonies are making decisions uh, ab about how to allocate their clearing forests, you know, when to clear, when not to clear, um, how to respond to different types of um, uh, obstructions. Uh, and the way we do this is pretty much by going out to the field and throwing an obstruction on a meat ant trail. Uh, this is uh, James Makinson, who was my postdoc at the time. Uh, he's now at the University of Western Sydney. Uh, and he's standing staring at this piece of turf grass. We just get regular turf grass like you would see on a lawn. Uh, and we've thrown that over the meat ant trail. And so the ants are trying to get from their colony to that tree um, where, they, where their main food source is. Uh, and so using that, we can sort of play around with the sizes of obstruction to see how ants respond. Um, that was fine at first, but we've sort of gotten a bit more sophisticated now. Uh, instead of using real grass, we've been using artificial grass that we can make. Um, with a precision cutting machine. And the beauty of that is now we can control the hardness of the obstruction, the size, the density, um, all sorts of different factors. And, and we've got a, I've got a few collaborators uh, who are helping on various aspects of this. Uh, and we can also get really good tra tracking data. So now we can track the movements of individual ants uh, and watch the clearing process happen clearly in, in time. And I mean, some of the things we've noticed, for example, is that the ants tend to start clearing from either end of the obstruction. So the nest end and the, um, the food end, and they kind of slowly come together and eventually meet in the middle, um, which is interesting. And all of this gives us some data that we're hoping we'll be able to ultimately throw into a model to help us figure out how ants are making the decisions. Um, and just to give you a taste of the other types of experiments we've been doing, uh, one of the things, again, we're interested in is understanding um, the decisions that individual ants are making about where to walk uh, and when to cut and when not to cut. And we do that by obstructing uh, the trail network of the trail of meat ants using a barrier. And so that green strip in the middle of the figure, that's the artificial grass. So it's annoying to walk through, but it's permeable. They can walk through it if they really want to. Uh, and then the rest of it is the, the black lines are an impermeable barrier. So something they can't walk through. So for that little ant, her, the decision is, do I go around the barrier? It's a bit of a deviation from the way you want to go, um, but it's smoother. Or do you walk through the middle, which is kind of annoying, uh, but is more direct. And then the second decision is, do you clear or not clear? And we can play around with different sizes to get a sense of how ants are, are making those types of allocation decisions. Uh, and in general, what we found so far is that when that obstacle is short, so when the angle of the deviation from the desired path is relatively small, ants will typically move around. So they won't even bother going through the, the obstruction that, or through the artificial grass, they'll go around. But when that deviation from their preferred direction is long, so when the detour length is long, then they'll sort of just more of them will go across the obstacle. And because there's more tra or less traffic on the obstacle and when it's a short obstacle, we tend to see less clearing. So they're investing less effort into clearing trails 
um, when it's not causing them to make a big detour. Whereas when there is a long detour, they tend to invest more in clearing. Uh, although interestingly, they pretty much clear everything within three days anyway. So they'll clear the long obstacle first, um, but you know, they will eventually get around to clearing the short obstacle. And there's a lot of variation between colonies. Some colonies, we put the artificial grass down and come back the next day and it's totally gone. Um, other colonies will take a few days to kind of get there. So there's quite a bit of variation. Uh, but we've got a nice rich data set now and the goal is to start to connect all these behaviors and all these patterns uh, and hopefully figure out how they're uh, optimizing the trail network as a whole. So, you know, this is really just, it's, it's a tale of two ants, right? We've got two ants faced with the same transportation problem, but both species, the species use very different ways of solving it. So the Argentine ant has been building these minimal networks that are very, you know, self-healing and dynamic and, and move around a lot. They're building it using this pruning process, whereas the Australian meat ants are investing more in the physical infrastructure of their networks, um, and they're building more balanced networks. They're building in some degree of topological robustness into the, the network itself. Uh, we don't really understand how those networks form yet, uh, but we're starting to see that there are, um, there, there seem to be making interesting decisions about how to allocate uh, clearing effort and how they choose their routing. And I always like to point out there are 20,000-ish species of ants in the world, so there's a huge, huge potential data set there and huge potential for comparing uh, how different species, you know, ones that lay trails, ones that don't lay trails, ones that use different combinations of pheromones, and how all of that uh, impacts not only the types of networks they make, but also their foraging efficiency and, and how they interact with the world around them. So uh, that has been focusing on sort of the multi-brained uh, end of things, so the ants. And now I want to switch gears and start thinking about how a brainless organism might do the same, might solve the same problem. So similar issues, but no brain to help you out. And so without further ado, I want to introduce my favorite of the brainless organisms. Uh, this is the acellular slime molds. Uh, they have great common names. So that yellow one uh, in the corner is called the witch's butter slime mold. The brown one in the middle is the dog's vomit slime mold. So yeah, not, not the nicest names. Uh, slime molds, you may have heard of cellular slime molds, which are these uh, little amoebas that when conditions get bad, they aggregate to form a multicellular organism. Um, I think most of us learn about that in um, cell biology. This is not the slime mold that I'm going to be talking about. It's, it's a distant relative. Um, my slime molds, the acellular slime molds, they're not really a collection of individual amoebas. Instead, this life stage I work with is really just one enormous uh, multinucleate single cell. So it's one cell with many nuclei. Um, it's not a collection of individual cells that are forming together to form an organism. Uh, they belong to the kingdom protista, which is kind of where we throw all the single celled eukaryotes we don't otherwise know what to do with. Uh, and my, much to my joy, <laughs> There is a slime mold appreciation and identification group if you want to see some beautiful pictures of slime mold spores. Uh, it currently has around 8,000 members, so slime mold love is popular, so you should, you should check it out. It's, it's pretty entertaining. Now, I'm going to try to play a video here. I, Zoom can be a little bit laggy, which isn't a huge problem because this is a time-lapse video anyway, but in the chat, Toby, if you wouldn't mind posting the link to the video as well, so if you want to see a, a cleaner version um, slightly different video that'll be in the chat and you can and look at that uh, as well. Uh, but so this is a time lapse of a slime mold. It's not my video. It's from um, uh, the Life History of Slime Mold movie. And what's cool is that all that yellow goo that you see, that's all one single enormous cell. Um, slime molds can get up to a meter in size, the largest one I've heard of, and it's all, all one cell. That single cell has millions of nuclei though. So as a consequence, you can kind of cut slime molds into little bits and each of those little bits will become a totally independent individual within minutes of being severed from the main cell. Uh, in the wild, they mostly forage on bacterial colonies, although occasionally they'll go after mushrooms like you can see in that video where it just oozes up. Um, it totally engulfs its food source and then slowly digests it. Um, that video is sped up. So you know, they're not moving that quickly in real life. But they do move at about five centimeters per hour, which is astonishingly fast when you consider this is basically just mucus. So it's, it's pretty much the blob. It's this weird giant blobby thing that goes around digesting um, all sorts of things. Uh, and slime molds also form transportation networks. So like the ants, they need to connect up different food sources. The difference here is that the slime mold 
is the network. So the organism's body is also the network. And you can see in, in this picture that there is some thickened veins and that's, um, the slime mold will shuttle its biomass through those veins and it will search for food using a search front, which is kind of like a fan-shaped part just on top of one of those, or at the end of one of those veins. Uh, and they can kind of move back and forth between being a search front and being a vein and, and their transportation network can form and reform. So in, in the early 2000s, uh, this, this gentleman, Toshiyuki Nakagaki, who's at the University of Hokkaido at the time, uh, he was a biophysicist studying the mechanics and the physics of slime mold movement uh, because slime molds, because they're giant cells, they were really used as model systems to understand cell motility. Uh, and then one day, and he's never told me why he thought of this, he took his slime mold and he popped them into a maze. And so in the maze, you can see there's two white piles. Those are food sources for the slime mold. Um, and he popped it in the maze and then just let the slime mold do what it wants. And again, there's a maze, there should be a maze video in the chat um, in case this one isn't working so well on your end. And, and what you can see is that initially when you put a slime mold in a maze, it kind of just flows everywhere. And then you can see eventually it starts to narrow down into distinct veins. So those veins are what it's using to connect up um, the bits of itself. And again, at first it's basically everywhere. It's kind of formed in the whole network. But gradually, it's going to start to pull away from particular parts of that. It, it tends to pull away from uh, dead ends, uh, and it tends to pull away from loops, so any kind of redundant loops. And if you give the slime mold about 72 hours, most of the time it will find the shortest path through that maze, which, you know, when I first read this, I was astonished. Like, I thought I was edgy studying problem solving in small brained animals. Well, here's an organism that doesn't have a brain, it doesn't even have neurons, it is nothing at all. Um, like a centralized decision processing system, yet it's able to solve, you know, mazes pretty handily. And again, it'll do this pretty consistently. So pretty astonishing. Uh, and not to be outdone, if about a decade later, um, a group led by Atsushi Tiro and with Tashi as well, uh, they got a map of the Tokyo metro system and then put oat flakes over the main metro stations in Tokyo and then let slime mold connect up those points. And the configuration they got was something that looked almost identical to the real Tokyo Metro network. And this has kind of become uh, almost like a hobby amongst slime mold researchers to take um, the maps of whatever city you live in and see whether the slime mold can optimize the system or not. Um, the reason slime mold networks often end up looking like the human ones is because human engineers and slime molds seem to be doing the same thing. We're trying to uh, find that a reasonable trade-off between uh, the length of the network or sorry, the cost of the network and robustness. So you get similar configurations. So that's really neat. I think one of the other cool things we can see from that is that there is this real pruning process. So those networks are forming because the slime mold is selectively removing um, links in a way that's very similar to the construction mechanism we see uh, in the Argentine ants. And whereas the Argentine ants use pheromones to kind of know where they've been, the slime mold does the opposite. So if you think, if you were able to see the video, you might've noticed there was like a white goo that gets left behind after the slime mold leaves. Uh, it's like the slime trail left behind by a slug. Well, we know from, from experiments that slime molds don't really like to go over areas that have that goo on it. So it's almost like the opposite of a pheromone. It helps to make sure they don't end up searching the same area twice. And so functionally, they're able to use this pruning process that's very similar to what we see in ants. And I, I think slime molds are one of those organisms that really catches the public imagination. And so you see all sorts of stuff about how they're astonishingly intelligent and, you know, they're redefining everything we know about brains, which is all, all fine and good. And most of that is based on this amazing ability to solve mazes. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, when I give talks, I always talk about the maze example because I think it's fantastic. But then one day, um, while I was just sort of playing around on the internet, I, I came across this. This is on YouTube. And what it is, and unfortunately you can't see it very well from this screenshot, but it's a man who's made a whole maze out of Lego. He's filled it with water and then he's poured milk into one end. And when you do that, the milk tends to follow the shortest path to, to the solution, to, um, to the outside pit, so where it's draining out. And so he's posted this thing that says, water and milk can solve the maze faster than slime molds. Like slime molds are suddenly our, our you know, <laughs> our, uh, best example of maze solving and they're the thing to beat. Um, he said it's in a counter example to the advocacy that slime molds may be intellectual. Uh, so I mean, he seems kind of annoyed with slime molds, but he makes a good point. I mean, milk here is solving shortest path problems. And so I was starting to get a bit concerned and did more digging and fell into this crazy internet hole. 
because it turns out that getting fluids to solve mazes is like a thing on the internet. So, so here is a, a clip from a paper in which somebody made a maze, filled it with creamer, and then got coffee to find the shortest path to the maze. And then the big figure B is the opposite, where they got a maze and filled it with milk and then used the coffee to find the shortest path through the maze. So it turns out the physical systems, and for um, reasons of fluid dynamics that I'm still not entirely across, you can often have a, a more dense liquid find the shortest path um, through a system as long as there's some flow. Uh, you can even do this with soap bubbles. So you can replicate Steiner tree experiments um, where you try to get things to connect up through the shortest possible path uh, and just dip it in soap water and the, the structure you get will be typically a Steiner tree. Um, and I've tried this experiment uh, just in the lab and it works really well. So this is um, both exciting and also kind of unnerving because None of these systems are alive. There's no um, information processing in the sense we normally mean it. These systems just converge on a minimum path solution as kind of the default. Uh, and so what does this mean for what we think about slime molds? Well, on one hand, I think slime molds are, it's still astonishing that they can do this stuff. I think it might provide some insight into sort of the very beginnings of how biological information systems or decision systems work, you know, essentially by co-opting existing physical rules. But then on the other hand, I mean, milk does it. <laughs> it just doesn't feel quite as, um, uh, as exciting. So one of the, I bring this up because I think slime molds are really, really good at solving shortest path problems, uh, much like the Argentine ants are, but is that all they can do? You know, are, are they really a one trick pony? And, you know, spoiler alert, of course, there's more they can do or I wouldn't be still talking about this. Um, but I, I think it's a really good way, this is a good point to sort of segue into the second set of problems. So transportation problems are interesting, but I think there is that um, interesting overlap between physical systems. And so the other sort of questions we work on, which kind of get away from that a bit, are our multi-attribute foraging problems. So this is the question of how do you make a decision, how do you make a decision when you have to choose between items that vary in more than one attribute? So. I mean, if you think about, if, if I gave you a choice between $2 and a million dollars, you know, you're gonna choose the million dollars all else being equal. More is typically better than less. I mean, it, it's an easy decision because there's only one attribute. But in reality, most uh, decisions are actually multi-attribute. So there are lots of different things that we may care about. Um, and we need to weigh all of those things up when we're making a decision. And it's the same for um, organisms in the wild. Things can get really complicated when there are more than one thing you care about and those things are in opposition to one another. Uh, I was recently uh, back home in Canada uh, on sabbatical and while I was in Montreal, I uh, of course had to have you know, the Canadian national dish, which is poutine. This is a fancy version of poutine. If you haven't had the joy of trying this, it's thick cut chips slathered in gravy with melted cheese curds on top. It is possibly Canada's greatest gift to the world uh, and it is objectively awesome. There's, there's no argument about that. Unfortunately, eating this frequently will kill you dead. It is, it is not a healthy food choice. And so often when you walk into a restaurant, you have a choice between say the delicious and clearly awesome poutine and the considerably less awesome but healthy um, salad option. Making a decision between these two things can be very tricky. And it's tricky because I care about two things. I care about how delicious my food is, but I also care about li living long enough to see my 50th birthday. Uh, and those two things are in opposition. So when you're faced with that kind of a choice, uh, the simplest heuristic, the simplest rule of thumb that one could use is simply to ignore half the information and have a simple rule like, I always choose the healthiest or I always choose the awesomest. Um, and, and that's what we would sort of expect at a very basic level of decision making. But if I'm a slightly more sophisticated decision maker, I might consider both attributes, so awesomeness and health, and try to choose one that gives me the highest overall Im uh, impact. And I could do this by assigning some um, metric to each of those items, doing some sort of calculation in my head, and then coming up with um, you know, the, the winner, in this case, the poutine, clearly. What's nice about this is that it allows me to be flexible because sometimes the healthier option or the least healthy option might actually not be the best trade-off. So for the other thing I ran into when I went home to Canada is this nightmare against food. Um, it's a sweetened maple flavored Belgian waffle with a veggie meat patty, uh, some egg and cheese. I don't know what happened to Canadian cuisine while I was gone. This went off the rails a little bit. This is much less awesome 
still not very healthy, still probably more awesome than a salad, if I'm honest. But in this case, I can do that calculation again. And now I'm going to choose the less healthy option. Or, uh, now I'm sorry, now I'm going to choose the salad because I get a higher overall score. So the having uh, being able to weigh up both options is useful and gives me more flexibility, but it's cognitively more expensive because I have to keep track of at least two things. So we could test whether or not slime molds are able to do this. Uh, and we did it by giving them, uh, by exploiting two features of slime mold biology. One, slime molds love oatmeal and you can, they prefer more concentrated oatmeal food sources than lower concentration oatmeal. So we can make that just by mixing uh, agar with different amounts of oats. Uh, and slime molds don't like light. They hate light. If it's probably the only reason they haven't taken over the world. As soon as they see light, they try to, to get away from it. Um, and so because of that, you can set up situations where the slime molds have to choose between a higher concentration oatmeal disc in the light versus a lower slime, a concentration disc that's in the dark and shaded. And then by playing around by the con with the concentration ratio between those, you can start to see whether or not slime molds make trade-offs or whether they have a simpler decision rule, like always choose the highest concentration or, or always avoid the light. And in case you're wondering what it looks like when a slime mold's making a decision, um, here's an example. This is a slightly different setup, but the higher quality food is at the top of the screen. Oops. Sorry. And you can see that after about an hour, the slime mold has sort of extended bits of itself onto all three discs. So it knows that the food source is there and it, it knows about all three of them. Uh, over time, though, you can start to see it's going more towards the field, the food disc at the top. And I should clarify that that is not growth that you're seeing, that's movement. All the slime mold is doing is redistributing its biomass at this time scale. It's not actually putting on any size uh, or growing. And ultimately, at the end of the experiment, and this is about six hours in, the slime mold has allocated all of its biomass to the higher concentration disk. So it's relatively easy to see what slime molds have selected. So when we do this, um, what you're looking at is a graph that has the concentration difference between the option in the light and the option in the dark uh, on the horizontal axis, and the percentage of uh, plasmodia or individual slime molds that chose uh, the food that was in the light, so the scary food um, that's higher quality. When the food in the light is not a whole lot better than the option in the dark, most slime molds chose to stay in the dark. But when the option in the light was much better than the option in the dark, then almost all the slime molds went into the light. So what we can see here is that the slime molds are making this trade-off, which uh, implies that they're using a more sophisticated um, decision rule that involves keeping track of both food concentration and light, doing something in their slimy decision-making systems, uh, and coming up with a way of trading off between those two. So that's a pretty, uh, seems like a more or less, more sophisticated behavior than we might normally think of for slime molds. And, and you know, I said before that slime molds are, are not a one trick pony and I won't go into uh, all of these now because we kind of are running out of time. Um, but I want to make the point that slime molds can actually do a whole lot of different foraging problems. Everything from what I've shown you now to uh, habituating to negative stimulus, for example, um, to balancing the distribution of their biomass to meet specific intake targets between protein and carbohydrates. So they are able to do a lot of behaviors um, that are very similar to what we see in insects and other animals. And so it suggests that even though they have a very different decision system, there are some real commonalities. Uh, and it's interesting to start exploring how those commonalities might work. And one way to do that is to think about what the actual heuristic slime molds might be using. So what are the decision rules that they are using um, to come up with these decisions? And I've already kind of talked you through one of these. So this is the idea that you assign a value to each of the attributes of interest, do a calculation and come up with your, um, the option you prefer. This is the cornerstone of things like economic rationality. It's also the idea that underlies optimal foraging theory. Uh, and what's important here is that if you are assigning an absolute value to things, then it doesn't matter what other things are presented at the same time. That value stays the same. And then you simply choose whichever of that cloud of items has the highest overall score. But the actual value is absolute and doesn't change. Uh, and this gets encapsulated in an idea from economics called indifference to irrelevant alternatives that says your preference for an option um, does not change if additional options are added to the choice set. And just to give you an example of what this would mean, if you imagine you walk into a socially distanced pub and you have a choice between a high quality expensive beer and a cheap um, but low quality beer, you know, either of those is a reasonable decision. Um, let's say you go, well, I don't wanna spend a lot of money, you buy the cheap beer. But let's say you walk into the same socially distanced pub um, with the same level of thirst, same amount of money in your pocket, everything's the same. 
The only difference is now there's an $8 low quality beer. It's still pretty terrible, but it's relatively expensive. And you might look at that and go, well, if I'm gonna spend $8 on a terrible beer, I might as well spend two more dollars uh, and pick the high quality beer. It's a better value for money. And while that makes sense, um, an economist would tell you that that behavior is irrational because it violates that independence, um, irrelevant, independence of irrelevant um, alternatives. That low quality expensive beer, you don't want it. It has nothing, you're not even really thinking about getting it, yet just its presence there has changed the preference relationships amongst other items in the choice set, which means that they are not being assigned a fixed or absolute value. We know that humans are very susceptible to these decoy effects. There's plenty of examples from marketing and economics and psychology. We're also starting to see um, that this is common in animals too. So there's some great um, pioneering work on honeybees by Shafir um, and starlings by Bateson. We've done some stuff on Apis serrana to show that um, Asian honeybees are susceptible to these. There's even nematode examples. So decoy effects appear to be common in, in animals. And one of the explanations that gets tossed around is that maybe there's some Thing about the way brains make decisions that causes this to happen. So we simply ask that, okay, if it's a brain-based thing, then slime molds should not be susceptible to these. So we, we check to see whether slime molds were susceptible to decoy effects. Uh, the way you do this is to give slime mold a choice between two things that um, are roughly should be equally preferred. So you run pilot experiments and know that they should choose each of them about 50% of the time based on what we know about slime molds. And then you get you compare that decision to what happens when you throw in a decoy, which is an item that's pretty crummy and that they shouldn't want. And so if they're not if they're susceptible to decoy effects, then the, the preference relationship between A and B will change when the decoy is in, in, is there. Uh, and so the results of that. Uh, so if in the binary situation where there's only A or B to choose from, the slime molds did what we expected and, and half of them chose A and roughly half of them chose B. There was no significant preference. When we threw in the decoy, that 1% item that's pretty terrible, that preference relationship completely changed. So now they're preferring um, one item more than the other. Um, so preference for, sorry, oh, those axes are a bit off, sorry. So preference for A has increased and preference for item B has decreased um, quite significantly. And that's important is that it's not because everybody's going to the decoy. There was only one slime mold in that experiment that was silly enough to actually choose the decoy. This is happening um, because the preference relationships have changed and that implies that slime molds are not using an absolute valuation mechanism. Um, and so the last thing I wanna say with like the minute or so I have left, this is speculation now. So it's the arm weighty part of the talk, but I think that's a really fascinating result because we have very different types of systems that are now all showing the same kind of weird decoy effect. Why could that be? And so I, was, I worked with some mathematicians to devise a model and we proposed that whenever you have populations of agents underlying a decision voting for an item, and when there's certain degrees of positive feedback which have evolved for specific types of choice sets, you can get decoy effects happening just as a consequence of that type of underlying system. In humans, the underlying agents would be uh, neurons, so neurons, different populations of neurons firing for items. With ants, you know, that's individuals laying pheromones. In slime molds, it's a bit less clear, um, but they do have a system where they oscillate more when they're on items they like, and they oscillate, they pump less when they're on items they don't like. And we know that each of those pulsing regions can train the, reason, the regions around it. So there's a system that seems at least conceptually similar to the other two. And so what that may mean is that, that you can have very different types of decision systems, brained, uh, multi-brained, uh, and brainless, but they may all be running a similar um, underlying process which allows biological systems to make decisions. Um, and so I wanna end by saying that I think um, the best way to start figuring out if this is the case and whether there really are these com common underlying rules is just to study decision-making in more systems. So there are plenty of organisms out there that we haven't looked at. Uh, and it would be super exciting, I think, to look at these in more detail to try to get a sense of how decision-making works uh, across systems. So I'm gonna stop there then, because I'm running out of time. Uh, happy to take questions if there are any. Um, just, uh, thanks to my lab, look at lots of collaborators because a lot of this work I could never possibly do by myself. Uh, and that was my lab as of 2018. So I'm happy to take questions now if there are any.